And now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Philip Nyhus. Philip is an Associate Professor of Environmental Studies. He earned his PhD in land resources from the University of Wisconsin. His interdisciplinary research bridges the natural and social sciences to address human interactions with the environment. Professor Nyhus and his students address policy and spatial dimensions of land and environmental conservation, human wildlife conflict, and endangered species conservation, particularly tiger conservation. So hold on to your hats. Philip, I turn this over to you. Thank you, Provost Kletzer, President Green, and thank all of you for taking time out of your busy and wonderful fall Friday afternoon to be here with us. The tiger is the world's largest cat among its most endangered carnivores, and the story of the rise and fall and recovery of tigers is part tragedy, it's part optimistic, but it's wholly worthy of the special animal one of the most magnificent on Earth. Over the next 15 minutes, I want to give a few examples of ways that Colby students have helped to write this narrative. I see this story as part of a bigger story, which is the environmental studies program here at Colby College, directed by my colleague Russ Cole. Among the oldest programs in the country, we're close to four and a half decades on, and we're proud of our inter- and multidisciplinarity our commitment to working together as faculty and students inside the classroom, in the laboratory, and in the field, and collaboratively working together to understand and to develop sustainable solutions to understand some of the most pressing problems in the state, in the nation, and the world. As we heard earlier with Whitney King, we do a lot of collaboration at Colby. My colleague Denise Bruzewitz was intimately involved in this research that Whitney talked about in the Belgrade Lakes and working with students not only to understand the science but the coupled human natural systems in lakes in Maine and indeed around the world. My colleague Lauren McClenahan is using history and ecology to understand how we can use the past to inform the conservation and policy future of our world's oceans. She and her students are at the forefront of the new field of historical ecology and as we heard earlier, environmental studies students like Annie Warner and others are involved in collaborations with Bigelow Labs, one of the world's premier deep ocean marine institutes. Travis Reynolds is using religion and economics and biology and importantly international environmental policy to study church forests with his students in Ethiopia to inform forest and food policy in Africa and around the world. Our students meet with leaders in the field of scholarship related to environmental studies, leading practitioners. They pursue their passions through internships. They learn new technologies to understand complex problems. And we are passionately committed to the idea of public service and civic engagement. As one specific example, students in Professor Gail Carlson's course worked with collaborators around the state to pass the Kids Safe Product Act, among the first of its kind laws in the nation designed to protect the health of children through uh, toxic substances in, chemical to in toys and children's products. Just to show you how intimately Professor Carlson was involved in this process, that's her son Soren standing next to then Governor Baldacci and Speaker of the House Pingree at the signing ceremony. Although truth in advertising, that also happens to be my son because <laughs> Professor Carlson and I are, are married. But it's still a good story. It's still a good story. <laughs> Let's get back to tigers. Over the last century, we have lost 97% of all the tigers that used to roam in the forests of Asia. This is in spite of every place tigers have lived, tigers play an important role in the culture, the religion, and the literature of these animals. Even here in places like the United States and around the world, the tiger is one of the most iconic species and it influences us through literature and economics and marketing and sports teams. But despite the importance of the cultural history and the ecological history and the economic in, uh, impact, we only have around 3,000 wild tigers like this South 
uh, the Sumatran tiger found in South Sumatra roaming the forests of Asia. We have lost over 93% of the habitat where tigers once lived. Increasingly, these forests and grasslands have been converted, they've been degraded, they've been fragmented for many uses, from agriculture to timber exploitation to plantations. And the millions of people living near and inside of these areas also struggle with their own livelihood needs for fuel and food and other resources. These fragmented populations are further threatened by poaching of both tigers and tiger prey for the traditional Asian medicine market. An area that my students and I are particularly interested in is the issue of tiger-human conflict. How do we coexist on a planet with seven billion people if we want to have large and dangerous carnivores sharing these landscapes? This is a picture of a young man I photographed two weeks after he'd been attacked by a tiger. You can see where his claws and bite marks remained. But this is an age-old problem. And indeed, as long as humans have been in existence, we have struggled to live side by side with large and dangerous beasts. The science writer David Quammen said it elegantly, if bluntly, in his book Monster of God when he said, among the earliest forms of human self-awareness is the awareness of being meat. And indeed, throughout much of human history, the way we've addressed this problem is we have eliminated the source of the problem by eradicating the animal, by eradicating their habitat, and eliminating the source of the problem. One of the things that my students and I are interested in understanding where this conflict happens, why it happens through space, and time, and importantly, beginning to understand solutions to preventing this problem before it occurs and to developing strategies to mitigate the problem after it occurs through programs like wildlife compensation and understanding what makes for effective management and policy recommendations to ameliorate this conflict. One of the areas that we've looked at is the role of captive breeding. Instead of eliminating the problem, some animals, like this tiger that had actually killed people, was brought into captivity, and now its genes will live on in a captive breeding program. What role does captive breeding play in large carnivore conservation? We have been involved with collaborators in China and around the world, working with the South China tiger, the world's most endangered tiger subspecies. We have already lost three tiger subspecies. The Bali, the Javan, and the Caspian tigers are now extinct. And uh, about a decade ago, my collaborators and I carried out and published the first study documenting the extinction of the South China tiger in the wild. Today, this animal is only found in captivity. Since that time, we have worked with our colleagues in China and other collaborators here in the United States and around the world to try and ask the question, can we reintroduce South China tigers? Should we reintroduce South China tigers? If we did, where would we reintroduce South China tigers? And if we did, how would we reintroduce South China tigers? This would be the first major tiger reintroduction ever attempted in the world. An important part of this story is the story of Colby College students like Courtney Larson and Jeff Carroll, now both graduate students at Colorado State University, or <clears throat> uh, Carolyn Hunt and Brendan Carroll, who did his PhD in international policy and is now a professor in Belgium. And many, many other students, a few of them listed here, and many more who I wasn't able to list on this slide. And they've played an integral role in developing some of the analyses for these projects. For example, Jasmine, Yu Wan Chin, walked into my office as a freshman advisee and started working with me in her first week. She completed an honors thesis in her senior year. She was awarded a prestigious Watson Fellowship to travel the world. She returned and had to decide whether to go to graduate school at MIT, Harvard, or Penn, and she selected Yale. <laughs> She is first author on a paper that was recently provisionally accepted by one of the world's top conservation journals. She's the lead author. There are other students that are co-authors. 
And what's impressive about this is their analyses and the maps these students have produced are playing an important role in this effort to reintroduce South China tigers. As we sit here this afternoon, the government of China is returning captive, wild, captive South China tigers back to China to start the very slow, very long, and very difficult process of putting tigers back into the wild. And I'm proud that Colby College students have played an integral role in that effort. This is a picture of an Amur tiger in Russia, but hopefully we'll be able to see something similar in the near future in China. Closer to home, we have a very different problem. While we have too few tigers in the forests of Asia, we have too many tigers in other parts of the world. With my collaborator, Ron Tilson, we carried out the first analysis of the number of captive tigers that may be around to try and give an estimate. A lot of energy has gone into studying wild tigers, but how many captive tigers are there? And we came up with an initial estimate that there might be three or maybe even four times as many tigers in captivity than are in the wild. <clears throat> Hundreds, if not thousands, of these animals are found in farms in East Asia. But almost certainly as many and probably more tigers are found in the backyards of homes in the United States than all of the forests of Asia. Our students have looked at questions like, how many tigers do we have in captivity? But importantly, what is the implication of this for animal health and human health? How many people have been injured and killed by these animals? We have tried to understand how the federal government and states and municipalities have tried to address this challenge. One of our earliest papers was actually used as testimony in front of the Senate before the passage of the Captive Wildlife Safety Act, a federal law that restricts the interstate uh, transport of tigers and other large cats. I was thrilled last week when three new presidential scholars showed up, Vivian, Luke, and Juno, and I'm delighted that they will be building on the legacy of what these past students have done as they create their own um, research moving forward working with tigers and other large animals. Let me just close with a somewhat optimistic story um, about the future of tigers. In 2010, the global community came together in St. Petersburg, Russia, under the auspices of the World Bank, hosted by then Prime Minister and now President Vladimir Putin. In attendance were five different prime ministers, the heads of multilateral donor agencies, every major international conservation organization, and other experts and practitioners. And this meeting was important for several reasons. First, the donor community committed over $500 million to tiger conservation, making this arguably the most significant single meeting on a single species ever held. Premier Wen Jiabao of China was in attendance and declared publicly that China was committed to returning tigers back to the wild. But the single most important thing that emerged from this meeting was the St. Peter's, Petersburg Declaration, where the leaders of every tiger range state committed to trying to double the number of the world's wild tigers by the next year of the tiger in 2021. This was an ambitious goal. This was a bold goal. This is a risky goal. But I actually feel much more optimistic that we'll be able to reach this goal of doubling the number of the world's wild tigers, knowing that ambitious, bold, and risk-taking Colby College students are going to be helping to write that story. Thank you very much. The floor is open for questions. If you would raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you.
Thank you, Philip. That was a good presentation. Thank you, Sahan. I'm curious about how much of the decline in tiger populations is caused by poaching and how much of this is habitat expansion and you know, land use change. And, and, there, and there's a, this is a two-part question. And if for the poaching, what you think about the idea of tiger farms? So I know there's some conservation organizations that actually support this, most conservation organizations that think it's a horrible idea. But in terms of the poaching, you know, if you think the tiger farms might actually be a potential solution. Thank you. Those are both absolutely terrific questions. So the, for the first question, habitat loss and tiger decline are closely correlated. So we've lost, nine, over the last century, century and a half, we've lost 97% of the tiger population, 93% of the habitat. So it's pretty clear that without habitat, we won't have tigers. But the second piece of that is where we have tigers, we need to have healthy tiger habitat that has enough food and water and reproducing tigers to survive. And what we're finding now is tiger populations are blinking out over these small threatened reserves because of the poaching. So when tiger populations are large, removing a small number of tigers has a relatively minor impact on these populations. When the tiger populations are small, any individual or group of tigers removed can result in the elimination and certainly um, long-term inbreeding issues with those populations. So certainly poaching is a key driver right now of tiger extinctions, but habitat loss is an ultimate driver over the long point. The second question that, that Professor Dasaniaki was asking was related to the idea of tiger farms. And there have been some uh, conservationists and economists who've asked the question, should we be farming these animals to feed the demand for traditional Asian medicines? We have done this with other species. Um, I, I remember hearing somebody a few years ago saying, um, who's ever heard of an endangered chicken, right? So if, if, if we treat these like, more like livestock, there are a lot of incentives to produce more of these animals. And we've done these with crocodiles um, in parts of Asia. One of the challenges with tigers is the, the animal rights question, the conservation question about whether there would ever be enough tigers to supply the demand for uh, tiger parts, um, and how you would monitor that if you did. So that's a, it's, a, it's a terrific question. Most uh, people in the conservation community are opposed to the idea of tiger farms, but there's certainly an idea out there, and there, there are influential people in the, in the government of China who are supportive of the idea of tiger farms. Great question. We have a, how about a question here, and then I, this, you'll be the follow-up. Thanks. This is a, a sort of a political question. To the five prime ministers that met in St. Petersburg, would be a challenge to get them around a table to talk about something like energy use, world peace. What, what were the domestic political pressures or international pressures that drove them to convene and talk about tigers? You know, that's a, that's a terrific question, and I think... Uh, <clears throat> what this shows is the power of something like the tiger to generate interest across countries and interests that might not otherwise align. And these are, these are uh, there are other species as well, but they are charismatic and they're iconic, and they have the ability to mobilize resources in a way that some others may not be able to do. The important piece of this, I think, was the recognition in the global community that we had done so much um, to try and get to this point, and we largely failed. Everything we'd done was resulting in declining tiger populations. But by putting out a commitment to double the number of the world's tigers that put everybody uh, on the record that this was going to be a priority they were going to have to try and achieve, which allowed NGOs and the media and others to hold those individuals and those countries accountable. So it's, it's, uh, uh, it would be great if we could solve world peace with tigers. I'm also all for that. Um, but I think that's, that's a way you know, to show that, that a lot of people care about conservation, and tigers is just one way to mobilize resources for that. Great question. We had a question right there. Let's, do, we, do we have a mic? OK, terrific. OK, with such a low population of tigers, as you mentioned, and even fewer in the control of our governments or uh, conservationists. Of course, I have to ask the question of 
genetic diversity and its long-term effect, especially considering that each of these individual populations that are held by our governments or in zoos in captivity are largely isolated from other groups and how even if you're trying to reestablish them now in greater numbers, it may put them at further risk later on. That's a terrific Sorry. question. And certainly the question of, of genetic diversity and, and long-term viability of small populations is one of the biggest questions and challenges in conservation biology. Um, but there are ways to manage that. For example, the genetic diversity in the captive population in North America of Amur tigers is higher than the genetic diversity of the wild population of Amur tigers living in Russia because of the historic bottlenecks. Um, the South China tiger has a population of over 100, but it emerged from six founders um, and has very high inbreeding. So there are going to have to be difficult questions that are ultimately more political than biological about moving tigers, for example, from one area to the other and hybridizing. We did that here in the United States with the Florida panther very successfully after a lot of debate about whether we should bring uh, animals from Texas to breed with Florida panthers. So it's, a, it's an important question. There's a lot of work and a lot of debate going around the health of uh, and the viability of these populations. But certainly in the captive breeding community, a lot of work has been done to think about ways to maximize breeding, to maximize genetic diversity. Great question. Hi, you said uh, one of the most important things um, was about um, rest restoring the uh, the habitat. Like, what are the most important steps to restoring the uh, the, the habitat of the tigers? And how uh, does, especially in places like China, how does uh, the boom in um, population growth, how does that affect um, tiger um, habitat restoration? Yeah, this is an absolutely um, key part of the entire puzzle throughout the tiger's range, whether it's degradation of existing habitat or restoration of habitat uh, that has been converted. Um, the work that Jasmine did that I talked about, for example, is actually modeling <coughs> potential prey abundance in areas where prey populations could be introduced and, and increased um, so that eventually there would be enough food for tigers. So habitat restoration is actually a, a very important piece of that. And what I didn't spend a lot of time talking with, but it's just as important, is the role of people. And the people on the landscape uh, where tigers live now, people who live on the landscape where tigers used to live and may live on the future. And they have to be an important part of this discussion and are throughout uh, the 13 tiger rain states. And that's another important piece of habitat. It's not just forest trees, deer, and tigers. It's also very importantly the people who live on and, and, and near those habitats. Great question. Thank you. Philip, thank you very much. Thank you very much.